Has ever, anybody ever been in a complicated relationship? Anybody out there ever been in a complicated relationship? Some of you are married and you're like, I'm in one right now. <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm in one right now, but she would be so mad if I raised my hand. It's complicated. Um, uh, the Facebook relationship status that you can post. I I'm thankful to say I've never had to like move my relationship Sorry. status to it's complicated um, because uh, my wife and I were like engaged to be married before Facebook ever existed. Anybody like me? Come on, the dinosaur, come on. Um, we, uh, our version of it's complicated was before Facebook. It was on MySpace. Anybody remember MySpace back in the day? You couldn't put that your relationship status was complicated, but what you could do is move somebody out of your top four and to your top eight. You know, whenever somebody would move a place down to like six, it was like, oh, what happened? Oh, you know what I mean? And, uh, and if you liked somebody, you would start them out in eighth place. Come on. And then week by week, as you talked a little bit more, you just moved them up until they were number one. And it's like, are we dating? Like, you're number, you're my top friend on, on MySpace. And uh, um, Tanya and I, our relationship at one point got a little complicated. Fellas, I'm trying to help you out. It's Valentine's Day in five days. Come on, go get some flowers, go get some chocolates, get your relationship uncomplicated, amen? And here's the thing. Okay, I'm just gonna put this out there. Women lie. Um, so, I'm just... <laughs> if they tell you they don't want any... This Valentine's Day, no gift. No exchange, no dinner, let's just hang out and, and we don't have to do nothing. They're lying to you, okay? They are, that is a bold-faced lie. Fellas, do something, let me help you. Let me keep it uncomplicated because if it's too complicated, it's just gonna not exist anymore, amen? You're gonna go to single. Um, so don't listen to the lies. Don't listen to the lies. Um, uh, the, the, the setup, the setup um, text for this series is this, and the book of Romans, that'll be on the screen, is this. It says, so Paul writes to the Roman church, he says, so here's what I want you to do. And I'm reading from the message translation, just because I really love the way Eugene Peterson puts this particular scripture. He says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. And then he says this, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God so you'll be changed from the, from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it, unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I think it's amazing how scripture, it applies like a thousand years ago, and it's like, this could be written today by, by somebody. Somebody could be blogging this right now about the culture that we live in. And I'll say this, when he says, don't, don't become like your culture, don't become so well-adjusted that you fit in without noticing it. Have you noticed that culture spends a lot of money to tell us what relationships should look like? Come on, somebody. They spend a lot of money. Hollywood spends a lot of money. There's the people who make a lot of money on Instagram to show us what relationships should look like, what you should look like if you're in a relationship and you're like, what? I don't fit that mold. I can't just buy a private helicopter and take my girlfriend to Fiji. Like, I just can't do it, ladies and gentlemen. I think the biggest lie out there, and me and my wife got hooked into this for a while, but we've been set free. We've been set free. It's The Bachelor. This is the biggest lie of all the lies of all the lies. Um, come on, so I'm getting a witness in the back right now. Come on, this is the first hand raise I've ever gotten at a magic church before. Uh, come on, somebody. Uh, the Bachelor, the Bachelor's a lie. And if you're a Bachelor fan, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You've been sold a bill of goods. Um, and uh, The Bachelor, I was just Googling, you know, I wanted to know, I wanted to make sure I wasn't lying when I said The Bachelor was false. Um, I found out there's been 23 seasons of The Bachelor. Do you know this? 23 seasons. 23 seasons of The Bachelor, and, and we're still watching. What are we doing? Like, what is going on? Oh, fellas, don't let you ladies watch this. That is false expectations. Um, and uh, out of 23 seasons, do you know that out of 23 seasons, two of the couples are still together? Two out of 23. And that guy gets up there, what's his name? The dude that hosted Chris, is his name Chris? What's it? Chris Harrison, he gets up and he's like, we're gonna show you what love looks like. It looks like one dude with 50 women. That's what it looks like. What is this? What is this? The second Chronicles? What is going on here? King David, what is happening? This is not how love is supposed to go. This is terrible. And uh, they get to the end and two out of 23, two out of 23 
are still together. They spend a lot of money to try to show us what love looks like, what relationships look like, what friendships look like, social media, the, the crazy things that people get to go experience and do. And, and we're sitting here like, we just play Xbox together. Like that's, that's our friendship. They spend a lot of money to try to tell us. And Paul says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit right in without even noticing it. You should be informed by God in your daily doings, in the daily things that you do. And one of the primary things that we live in every day is relationships. Come on, that's one of the main things. Whether it's a dating, a married, engaged, or just a friend-to-friend -friend level, we engage in relationships on a daily basis. And we need to get God's point of view on what healthy relationships should look like. So I wanted to let you know, this series is for everybody. It's not just for those in a, in a, in a serious relationship. This can be applied to family, friends, etc. cetera. Um, Tommy and I did have a, a complicated story when we, when we decided to, to start dating and, and actually, we went to a church where we had to court. So we courted, um, we had a burning candle and we could only talk while the candle, and when the candle had finished melting, we had to, come on Stephanie, don't act like Pablo, or your dad has not tried it at some point, don't even try it, come on, I know that man. Um, anyways, um, and, and this, this, this was what our relationship looked like. And, and at one point it got real complicated. I was, uh, I was serving the Lord overseas on a mission trip and uh, I was giving my heart to the Lord and preaching to these German students and uh, I came home, and Jordan's not here today, um, but Jordan leads our First Impressions team. Jordan was one of my friends and Tanya's friends. She slipped a, a, a letter onto the dashboard of my, my Ford Ranger, my white 98 Ford Ranger. It was the best, I called it the Power Ranger. You know, it was, it was just amazing. It's the White Ranger's the best Power Ranger. I mean, it just is what it is. Um, and uh, and, 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 I, and the, the, the letter said, do not open till you get home. Put that on the letter? Like, of course I'm gonna open it right now just because it says don't open it until you get home. Apparently, Tanya was concerned that I would get in a car accident if I hadn't read the letter because I would be so emotionally devastated by the Dear John letter that she had left on my dashboard. She I came home from a missions trip. Mind you, okay, this wasn't in my story, but mind you, before I went, I had really long, red, curly hair. I was a rock star, lip ring, the whole thing. Todd, you remember my long hair, man? Bass player in the worship team, you know? Shout out, Matt. And uh, I, uh, I went away on a mission trip. Todd, you were there. You were on the mission trip with me. Did we share the same room? Me, you, and Zeke, right? Wow, shout out. Um, good times. And, I, and, 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 and she was like, I like his hair, but if he cut it short, and dyed it black. I would like it even more. <sighs> I wish I was joking right now. I found this out, so I went to Walmart and I bought some just for men. And uh, I, uh, I went to Walmart to the great clips in the Walmart and the lady cut my hair off. And I kid you not, people from Walmart were gathering around to see the animal sized amounts of hair that were all over the floor. It's thick, guys, it's thick. and. Uh, and uh, the lady's like, why are you getting your hair cut? I'm like, oh, my girlfriend, <laughs> you know, she likes it short, so I'm cutting it. And I went home and I dyed my hair. I, I colored my beard. <laughs> I, I kid you not, I was in love, Lydia, okay? Like, I was in, this was it. Somebody said they liked me, you know? Like, I was tripping on myself, okay? And, uh, and I, even, I even put some Just For Men in the eyebrows because you can't have red eyebrows. You know, you can't have red eyebrows with black hair and a black beard. No? Okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't know. I left the next day for the mission trip, and I came back, and she broke up with me. And... Uh, I went home that day, and uh, The Notebook had just came out at that time. I was a big romantic. I was really into The Notebook. It was my favorite movie. Actually, my favorite movie ever is Sleepless in Seattle. Um, and that's kind of where I got Jonah from, because Jonah is Tom Hanks' son's name in the movie. So anyways, I'm a helpless romantic. And uh, I went home that day, and I crawled into the shower, turned the water on, fully dressed, and just soaked myself. I don't know why. I don't know why. Don't judge. It's complicated. And... Uh, and, uh, and it got weirder when my mom crawled into the shower with me and sat down on the floor with me and was like, baby, you deserve better. <laughs> I've been wanting to tell you the whole time you're too good for her and I just didn't want to break your heart. And I'm like, no, it's love. 
I said I like you. I can never take that back because I was super Christian. You know, like once you said you like somebody, it's like you've just given away a part of your soul, you know, and you can't get that piece back. And uh, um, Tanya dumped me. In her mind, we weren't together. To me, it was just complicated. And, uh, you know, six months later, six months later, with a lot of hustling and a lot of work and a lot of, you know, books and a lot of hanging out with her cousin, <laughs> you know, a lot of that, um, she came back. And the rest is history. <sighs> Where was this going? Okay, it's right here. <sighs> okay, it's right. She dumped me. I thought it was complicated. Okay. That's what, all of that was. She dumped me. I thought it was complicated. That's it in my notes. I've got seven pages left, guys. So let's just get right along. Some of you are stressed out now. Um, <laughs> if we want to uncomplicate our relationships with each other, hear me today. I want to set up this series. The first thing we need to do is we need to uncomplicate the most important relationship in our life. If we want to have uncomplicated relationships with the people around us, the first thing we need to do is uncomplicate our relationship with God. It's the foundation, it's the, it's, the, it's the cornerstone of every relationship that we're, we're ever going to have. If we're going to have uncomplicated relationships around us, if we're, going to, if we're going to make it through, if it's going to make sense, and it's going to be in unity, then we first need to uncomplicate our relationship with God. And what I want to do, you know, the core of every relationship is this idea of love, right? Love. I love them. I love my friends. I love my family. This is what bonds us. It's what, it's what gets us through the hard times. It's, it's what we celebrate in the good times. It's love. It's love. If we're going to uncomplicate our relationship with God, then I think what we need to focus on this morning is uncomplicating God's love. We need to uncomplicate God's love. Why? Because if we can uncomplicate God's love, then it will allow us to give and receive love in every other relationship in our life. It'll give us the ability to be able to give our heart, give our love to people, and it'll give us the ability to feel like we deserve love. And we should be loved. I am valuable, even though I dyed my hair black and sat in the shower crying. Lord, I love you. Lord, would all these words be yours, none of me, all of you. I love you, Jesus. Lord, I pray in this series that people would be able to leave this place knowing how they can get the most out of and be the most in every relationship that they have. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've got another story before we go any further. Okay. I've told you once that sitting in youth group after youth group a long time ago, my sister was the conduit between me and Tanya because we were emotionally dating because we weren't allowed to hold hands. Come on, somebody. It was real Pentecostal. We weren't allowed to hold hands. We, we emotionally dated for three years before there was any physical contact. I mean, holding hands, people. Um, so uh, we were in youth group afterwards, and I had told my sister... I want to tell Tanya I love her. And she told my sister, I, I want to tell Sean I love him. And so it's this moment after youth group, we're sitting with each other, everybody's left. Todd had to throw us out, you know, like, just leave, people, just leave. And uh, and I'm ready, and, uh, and Tanya goes, I love you. And I'm like, no, you're not supposed to say it, I'm supposed to say it, you know, you stole my moment. Tanya did say I love you first, she did, I will give her that, because she's a thief, okay? She stole my I love you, she stole it. But I will have you know that I loved her first. I'll just I'll set the record straight right now. I loved her before she loved me. And it's important for me that you know that. It's important for me that you know that. Because Tanya didn't always love me. I know that's hard to imagine. I know. You're like, what was wrong with her? Tanya didn't always love me. But, come on. Somebody always notices the other one first, right? Somebody notices the other one first. And it was my pursuit of her, come on, it was my pursuit of her that helped her fall in love with me. Where my fellas at, come on, you pursued that lady, right? You pursued her, you swooned her, you, you finessed it. Come on, somebody, you worked the system. You know, you were leaving little letters and little notes and little likes on every other picture. Because you don't want every picture, every other picture. Drop a comment once a week. You know, you pursued. I pursued her and I made her notice me. I know that's silly. But it sets up my first point today. I want you to know point number one in today's talk is this. God loved you first. God loved you first. John 4, 19 says this. We love because he first loved us. John, John, John sets it up perfectly. We love because he first loved us. It sets the record straight. Before you loved God, God loved you. Why is it important for you and I to realize? Why is that a point? Why? Because... If, if, if God loved me first, that means my love for him had no influence on his decision to love me. 
So that means before I ever did anything, before I ever went out of my way, before I ever lifted my hands in worship, before I ever made a decision and swooned him into the relationship, he was busy pursuing me. His love came first, and my love is a response to his love. That's why I need people to know I loved you first, okay? It's important because I'm like Jesus in this scenario here. His love for you came without any convincing. Come on. He didn't have to talk you out of the red hair setup and the black beard. Like, he didn't have to make you see the diamond in the rough. He didn't have to look for He loved you first. This matters because you and I can't pursue someone into loving us. With enough finesse, we can sway someone. But the beauty of God is this. We didn't pursue him. He pursued us. When humanity was lost, Come on, the world was broken. Jesus left heaven and came to earth to say, here's what my love for you looks like. Here's what it looks like in Jesus. And if you read the book of John, the word love is used over and over and over. I still love the world. I love the world. The people who don't love you, yes, I love the world. Come on, a Christianese, the world is just a term for sinners. Come on, somebody. You know, when we say the world, we're not like the world. Come on, that's a term for people who don't know, do not know God. And Jesus says, I, I came because I still love love the world. God so loved the world that he sent me. That anyone who would know me could know him and have eternal life. Jesus' love, God's love, preceded your love for him. Hear me today. God loves you. God loves you today. But I don't love him. You're in the, I don't love God. Well, I don't care. He loves you. Like you, you can't get out of it. I don't care if you don't love him. I don't care if you scorn him. I don't care if you blog about him. I don't care if you comment with your mean quotes. I don't care what you do. He loves you. And you, he's like the crazy girl in a bad relationship. No matter how many warning signs there are, she's like, but I love him. I just, I, I see past it. I see past it. He's that, he's that guy. He's just, I love you. I love you. I love you. He loves you simply because he loves you. I, I, I know it sounds simple, but really just let that sink in. He loves you because he loves you. That's it. There's something about you. There's something about who you are. There's something about everything you're made up of that he is infatuated with, that he loves with this agape, this, this all-enduring, never, never ceasing love. And I know... We've all done some bad things, right? Come on. We, we've all done things in relationships that caused our relationships to get complicated. If my wife knew the things that I've done, the things that I've said, if she knew my dark side, if she knew that, you know, I cheated on my taxes, you know, like if she knew the things that I've done, the things that I've seen, the things that I've said, if he knew the, the parts of my heart that, that don't even feel anymore, if they knew the deep, dark parts of me, right, come on, they wouldn't really love me. And I know we take that and we go, well, maybe if God really knew me, he wouldn't really love me. I'm glad you brought it up. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, my favorite movie, my favorite comedy is Nacho Libre. Any Nacho Libre fans in the house? Come on, somebody. Nacho! Uh, Nacho Libre. Um, and, and the movie Nacho Libre, Nacho, who's played by Jack Black, falls in love with Encarnacion. Uh, Encarnacion. He falls in love with Encarnacion. And uh, there's this moment in the movie where Encarna or, or uh, 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 Nacho comes to Encarnacion's quarters late at night, and he slips some burnt toast under her door. And she opens up the door, and she's like, Nacho. It's late, <laughs> you know? And he's like, I thought you want some toast. And he gives her some toast, and they sit down, and they have this conversation. And they're talking about their interests. What are you into? Well, what are you into? And they're going back and forth, and she's like, I like volleyball, and puppies, and taking walks on the beach. And Nacho goes, are you kidding me? Everything you just said is my favorite thing to do every day. You know, every day, I love to do exactly everything that, that you just said. Nacho is in love with Encarnacion. Come on, how many of you know when we enter relationships, come on, 95% of the time, we just want the other person to know how likable we are. And so we show our highlight reel. We show them all the good things about us. Look how much we have in common. I'm thinking it the whole way, but we have so much in common. It's amazing, you know? And 95% of the time, we want them to know all the good things about us while we hide all of the dirty secrets. Come on. We enter relationships with our highlight reel. 
with our highlight reel, all the things we have in common. Come on, dating sites. I've never been on one. I thought about it in that shower that day, uh, but I didn't go to eHarmony. I didn't go there. But if you go to a dating site, it's gonna ask you a series of questions to get to know you. It doesn't ask you, what's the worst thing you did last week? <laughs> Have you ever shot somebody? Like, have you ever been to jail? Have you, it doesn't ask you these things. It's like, what are you into? What do you like to do on your days off? What do you do for a living? How much money do you make? And then what's your best picture? And it's like, eh, error, error, get a new picture. You know, like, failure to upload, that's a bad headshot, get a new one. Dating sites want you to answer with the best questions possible. And I know this, because I've sat in a lot of Counseling sessions with married people. Most people get married with ever, without ever having shared the deep, dark secrets. And then at some point, they inevitably come to the surface at some point, and all the deep darkness, all the hidden stuff, all the things we never got past while we were still single, or in that family relationship, mom and dad, whatever, all the things that we try to hide from everybody, our friends, so that they think we're good people, it comes to the surface. And then we've got a face the reality that you and I have darkness in our hearts. And we think, well, God could never love me if he knew the dark parts, if he knew all the bad things. Can I just say, I'm so thankful that's not how God does things. I'm just so thankful that he doesn't work like you and me. Romans 5 eight says this, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And while you were at your, listen, at your darkest moment, sir, at your darkest moment, ma'am, at the worst of the worst, point number two, God loved you at your worst. God loved you at your worst possible moment while you were still sinning, while you were still doing the things that nobody knows about, while you were still saying those dark things and, and watching those things and entertaining and acting in ways and partying and doing whatever it was to numb whatever you were trying to numb. God saw all that. And he loved you at your worst. At your lowest moment, he loved you. I, I like to say it like this. It was love at first sight for God. And love at first sight for us is, oh, she's fine. You know, like, oh, she looks good. And even better when she walks away. Come on, somebody. I, I love at first sight. Here's what God said. I see all the potential for good, but I see all the darkness at the same time. I see everything they've ever done and everything they're going to do. But I am in love. It's love at first sight, and I'm never going to fall out of this. It's love at first sight for God with you. He sees all of your potential to do good, and at the same time, he sees all of your potential to do evil. And he says, I'm just in love. <laughs> I just, I'm just in love. I'm so in love with people. All the potential for good, all the potential for darkness. He sees us. I'll clarify it for you a little bit. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says this. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. Imagine a, a foggy room and you're looking into, a, you get out of the shower and the, and the mirrors were foggy, you know what I'm talking about? And you, you gotta kind of wipe to see clearly. Anybody ever try to shave when it's in this? Like, that? Like, oh man, I messed up, dang it, no. And uh, you know, and it's gonna take four weeks for this to go back, it's awful. <sighs> Unless you're dead and his facial hair just grows like on command, it's crazy. It says, for now we see in a mirror dimly lit, but then face to face, he says this, Paul writes this, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, meaning one day I'll know all the mysteries of God. One day I'm going to see him for all he really is, and all of him is going to be revealed to me. And it'll be like a book. I'll be able to read all that he is and know him completely. But he says this, even as I have been, been is present tense, or past tense, been. It means currently and past tense. It's even as I have been fully known. If you need to hear this this morning, you are fully known by God. Everything that you might try to hide, everything that you might try to cover up, everything you might try to mask with some makeup to cover it all up, you can't help but be fully known by him. He knows everything about you. He knows your innermost thoughts, the Bible says. He sees from the inside out. You can't hide anything with him. So understand today, this can be a very simple message for you, or this can be the most profound thing you've ever heard in your life if you'll get it. No matter how dark you have been, he loves you. You are fully known. But if I told her, he, she would walk away. If I told my parents, they would renounce me. They would kick me out of the family. Maybe, but he won't. You are fully known by God. He sees it all. 
and he declares to you today, this morning, come on, imagine, I love you. I see you. I know the pain. I know the hurt. But I love you. And I can't help but love you. And not only does he love you, not just with any love, Jesus himself defines what the top of, you know, if love is, you know, getting her a, a Tesla, you know, like, that's love, you know, like, anybody ever watch those Christmas commercials where there's a car in the driveway and you're like, is that real life? Does that really happen? Because, like, I would appreciate if my wife went and bought me a Mercedes, but I want to pick out my Mercedes, you know what I mean? Like, I would be like, no, this is the wrong color. It's black on black on black on black. Come on, somebody. That's how I like my cars. Anyways, so I dress, um, and, uh, uh, I would, the greatest form of love, Jesus defines, he defines it this way in John 15, 13. He says, greater love has no one than this. Okay, stop right there. No, no, there's no greater love. There's no higher platform. There's no greater expression of love. This is the greatest expression. Then that someone would lay down his life for his friends. Come on, we know the end of the story, right? What did Jesus do? He put his money where his mouth is. He went to the cross and he said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's still making excuses for us on the cross because his love is just so full for you and me. For they don't even know what they're doing. If they knew the love that I have for them and the love that, and what this could do for them, they wouldn't do this. So his final expression of love was to do what he said was the highest expression of love. Listen to me. God has read your bio. He's been on your AOL profile. He's seen. He's read it all. He knows all about you. He's been on your Facebook. He clicked the learn more button. You know, the about info. He scrolled through your work history. You know, he scrolled through your edge. He knows everything about you. The good, the bad, and all the in between. And he just says, I don't care. I just don't care. I love them. And I know I'm sounding redundant. This is helping anybody this morning. I, I just, I know this can be simple, but if you really get it, this will change your life. This will change the game for you if you'll really let this seep in. This will change the game for you. I love them. I love her. But Jesus, they're going to hurt you. They're going to lie about you. They're going to write blogs about you. They're going to form religions against you. They're going to, they're going to march against your church. They're going to say things. They're going, to, they're going to drag you into politics. And they're going to say the good things that you said are evil things. The, the, the Bible says that, that the good things will turn into evil things at the end of the day. That, that, that what's truth will become, will become an evil. And he said, I don't care. I love Shad. I love Tanya. No matter how bad he's been, I love him. Um, I alluded to it a little bit during the close of worship and I'm going to do it in a little bit different format than this because this does go out on the platforms. I, and I hope you, if you don't like transparency, this probably isn't. If you need Moses, I'm probably not Moses for you in that you're only going to see the power. I'm going to give you my story. I, I grew up in a broken home. I grew up my mom had me at 17. Um, in transparency, my biological father, I didn't even get his last name, and I kind of say the story in a weird way because I don't like people to know all my dirty secrets, but my mom was dating somebody else and she tried to put his last name on my name. So I was Shadrick Clevenger when I'm a Peyton. But I spent most of my life seeing my biological father who lived maybe five miles down the street. It's Brooksville, it's a small town. Maybe six months, 12 months. Once we'd go to the racetrack in Inverness and he'd drink and place bets and I'd eat peanuts. And I'd be ridiculed the car ride there and the car ride back about how stupid my mother is. Anybody grew up in a broken home? And so growing up, I had a dad complex. While my stepdad was amazing, he was my dad, like I said that earlier. I'm proud to call him my stepdad because when mine stepped out, he stepped in. Stepdads are some of the greatest heroes that have ever existed when they step in and they love completely. I never knew I, was, I wasn't his. He made me feel complete and full as his son. The day he died was the hardest day of my life. But there was a void. 
there was a void. And I like to say it like this, if I were to take a pair of sunglasses and throw them on my face, I would see this room through the tinted lens of those glasses, right? Does that make sense? I would see the room through that tinted lens. If I were to take them off, I would see clearly. If I put on blue lenses, what color would the room be? If I put on red lenses, purple, doesn't matter. If I put on any color lens, I'm going to see the world around me through the color and the shade of that lens. And because I grew up having a relationship with somebody who should have loved me fully, who should have been at everything, who had no excuse and no reason not to fight for it, but because I grew up in that reality, I've had a lens on me ever since I was a little boy. That is just too good to be true. Some love and some people, they say they're gonna be there, but really, come on, they're not really gonna be there. And I was touched during worship earlier, and he can get mad at me later, but, but, but when Ned sings Beautiful Father, I know that's probably a hard lyric for him to sing. And you can fill in the gaps. It's probably a hard thing for him to get up and declare that he has a beautiful father that he can trust and talk to about anything. I don't think that's really his point of view, and it's not really my point of view, because it's been hard. But my lens convinces me that because he wasn't there, at some point, hear me, God won't be there. It's just too good to be true. A third point, hear me today, not only did God love you first, not only did he love you at your worst, but number three, God's love isn't going anywhere. Romans 8, 37 through 30, 39 says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is one of the most powerful pieces of scripture in the Bible. Hear this. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul said, it's not going anywhere. I don't know who's hurt you, ma'am. I don't know who's hurt you, sir. I don't know who was supposed to be there. I don't know what appointments they were late for and they didn't show up to. I don't know about your little league games and the moments where you begin to form this broken lens that you have saw all of humanity in love through. I don't know when and where it happened and who did it. But they're not God. And God says, Paul says about God that there's nothing that can separate you from his love. I've been saying this a lot on in our services, and I, I, want, I want to help our church get this clearly. Hear me. My experiences, my experiences, what I've been through, they influence my thoughts. I'm a product of my experiences. What I've seen in this world and what's been done to me creates a thought pattern inside of my mind. Okay? Does that make sense? What I see impacts and influences my thoughts. And my thoughts will inf will, will inform my decisions. Therefore, because other people said they loved me, but, come on, but they cheated. They abused me. You don't know what it was like to be little and be yelled at and beat. I don't know what your experiences are. I don't know who didn't behave the way they should have, and I'm sorry that they did that. Sorry that they hurt you. I'm sorry that I have family members who are a product of, of aunts and uncles abusing the little boys and girls. I, I just, I don't know what you've been through. But I've been in this seat long enough to know the world's been through a whole lot. I sat with students over the years. And can I just say, some of the things that happen to us when we're young are the things we can just never let go of. They just grip us. To the end of our days, our lens is forever jaded because of what happened when I was seven. When I was six, seven, eight, nine years old, driving in those cars and hearing your mom's dumb. You know, oh, 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 you're going to be a pastor. You're wasting. You should be a football player. You should be a lawyer. You should make money. That's a waste of a God-given ability. You should be doing more with your life. My experiences 
inform my thoughts. My thoughts inform my decisions. And so because I've been cheated on, abused, lied, took advantage of, demeaned, they've acted cold to me, they've walked out, they've walked away from me. Now I have a lens that says it's always going to be this way. It's always going to be this way. So every relationship is jaded, even our ability to accept God's love. And whether you realize it or not, because that's why I said it earlier, if you could really get in the arms of a beautiful father, you would realize, come on, come on, where my dad's at? I don't want my kids to ever know that they'll have a need. I want, to, I want to pay every bill. I want to make sure they have all that they need in life. When I can get around the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he becomes my dad and he takes care of every need inside of my heart and he satisfies my soul, I can trust. I can take risks. I can challenge myself because my dad's not in the church planning process. I wish I could have sat with my dad. My dad, Brian, Jonah, Brian is named after my stepdad. If I could sit with Brian and just go, can you help me? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to raise money. I don't know how to pay bills, man. I don't know what is going on. I could really use a conversation. Come on, when you get a picture of a good father, you know if I fail, dad's got me. I can always go back to dad's house and dad's going to make sure that if they said something about me, my dad's going to step down, he's going to pull his belt off, he's going to whip somebody. You know, talk about my son like that. If you could get a hold of this love that God has for you. We're just waiting around for this God thing to be too good to be true. It's just too good to be true. It's just, it's just too good to be true. Meanwhile, over and over throughout scripture, we see God just reaffirming from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. God says the same things redundantly in different ways over and over and over again. So we'll go all the way back to the book of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, the sad guy. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 31, 3, that I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Hear me today, God's love is everlasting. It's not going anywhere. You can't shake it. Others might have left you. You might have made too many mistakes with them. You might, you might be the person in this room that hurt somebody else and removed their ability to love you. And you're suffering from that. And they might have stopped loving you. But hear me today, he never will. Hebrews 13, 5. I'm giving you scriptures over and over again that say the same thing. Come on. <laughs> if something's in the Bible once, you got to study it. If it's in there over and over and over again, it's just the truth. Come on. It's just the truth. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll show up to your baseball game. I'll be there on your wedding day. I will be there for you every step of the way. You can't shake me. I'm following you into every season. You're a single mom, a single dad. You're, you're, you're in a complicated relationship and it feels like everything is falling apart around you and everybody who's supposed to be there isn't. God says, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. God loves you today. Just you. You, all of you. Every part of you. Every bad thought. Every worry. Every stress. Every bit of strife, every bad moment, every late night argument, every internet browsing mistake you made, everything that you've ever done, he sees it and says, I love you. They might stop. Come on. People are imperfect. But he says, I'm not going to. The good, the bad, the in-between. This is my closing thought and we're done. The power of God's love, hear me, can change everything for you. It can change the whole game. Because when I realize how loved I am, I don't care if people leave me. I don't care if I'm not in good enough shape. Like, I want to be in good shape. But if my wife says, hey, baby, it's just not working out for me. There's a love that's not leaving me, even if she ever did. And she never will. I love her. She loves my roles. Come on. 
if a father who's supposed to be there isn't, if a brother, if an ex, if, if, if children have walked out, if you've been hurt and you've been abused and everybody else has left you, if I can just wrap my mind around the fact that if everybody else goes, the author, the finisher, the creator of all things isn't going anywhere. I always have him to go to. I have a beautiful father who's never leaving. Then it gives me the ability to give love. I can give, I can give myself away now. Because even if they take it and throw it in the trash and, and abuse it or cold to me, so what? I still got him. And though the world may be against me, if he is for me, and then I can, I can receive love. If he, God, loves me at my darkest, at my worst, then I can stand up and declare, if he loves me, then I do deserve love. Some of us just don't think we deserve love. And we struggle with the idea of receiving love. So we self-eject. Hear me today. If you can get a hold of this thought today, you'll be able to receive love. The caveat, the but, the big asterisk on all of this is that God's powerful love is diminished and given no effect if we are unable to receive it. Come on. If I don't receive it and accept it and embrace it and take it and let it get in me, all that love is just sitting outside and it does me no good. It's not doing anything for me. All I say it's like this. It's like the girl who's trying to find a boyfriend. I mean, while somebody's been put in the friend zone. On, have you ever been put in the friend zone? He said, you're in the friend zone. And you're like, girl, I love you. I always open the car door for you. I pay for your food every time we go out. You don't even, but you're going for the bad dudes. Like, he's offering her love, but she ain't taking it, right? And she keeps getting hurt by everybody else. Quit taking love from everybody else, but not from God. Receive it today. And it will change the game for you. So what I want to do is I just want to ask for every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in the room and you say, Pastor Shad, you know, I'm not, I'm not in love with God. I don't, I've never started. But man, that sounds like some good love. I mean, everything that I've done wrong, he still loves me. Yeah. And it can have the power to change your life. Ma'am, sir, today if you'll receive it. If you don't receive it, it does nothing for you. It's just good love out there. But if you want to receive it today, if you want to say, Pastor Shadow, I want that love. I want to accept that love into my life. I'd love to give you the opportunity. It's the privilege of my life to give this opportunity to you to say, hey, if you want that love, hear me. It is a conversation away. The love of God will come flood your life. He will enter in and he will give you it all. He doesn't hold back. He gives himself freely. So if you're in the room and you say, hey, that's me. I, I want God's love. I, I, want, I want forgiveness. I want to be in right standing with God. I want, I want to start that journey today. Then I want to give you the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. To give him the ability to give you that love. The love that you deserve. Please don't let the voice of doubt corrupt what you know is right in this moment. If that's you, my pastor, you say it like this before the devil changes your mind. Would you do this right where you're at? If you want God's love today, would you just slip your hand up right where you're at today? Slip it up. Come on. His hands all over the room. I want that love today. Come on, I see him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can put him down. Thank you, Jesus. Here's what I want us to do. For those who lifted their hand, and man, if you didn't lift your hand and you know you should have, I want you to pray this prayer with us. If you love Jesus in the room, I want you to pray this prayer with my friends. And if you love Jesus in the room, say it loudly because y'all always whisper it. Say it loudly. Repeat after me. If you raised your hand, come on. Jesus, today I receive your love. I want to be known by you. I want that love. So Lord, would you forgive me of everything 
I've ever done to put distance between us. Take it all away. Would you give me that everlasting love? Would it change me? Would it clean me? Would it be what makes me right with God? Thank you for your love. I receive it. Forgive me, Lord, for all the time I've chased love in all the wrong places. Today, I accept yours. Amen. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, can we just can we just give a round of applause and just celebrate every person who said yes to Jesus today? Come on, it's a big deal. May it never not be a big deal. The greatest miracle in the Bible is not blind eyes being open. It is not deaf ears being able to hear. It is not the dead being raised physically. It is the dead soul coming back to life. It is the dead spirit being resurrected and being brought back to the Father's house. We just saw the greatest miracle. So if, if you don't, if you didn't wonder, if you want to know for a miracle working church, we're a miracle working church right there. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the greatest miracle. I want to leave you with this just with some encouragement as you walk out today. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, that now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. And he says this, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and everyone else, just as ours does for you. I want to focus in on one little part there. It says, hear me today, if you struggle with loving people, come on, I struggle with loving some people too. This is the foundation of it because what he says is, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow. What does that mean? God can make your ability to love others increase. Your ability to give and receive love. So if you've been jaded, if you've been hurt, and you're like, I can take God's love, but anybody else, that's going to be a hard time. Paul says, yeah, it's going to be a hard time. But if you'll trust God, he will make it grow to the overflow and you will be able to give yourself away and embrace the love and give love to all of humanity, amen. That's why we stay at Imagine Church, we love everybody. Because our ability to love has been made to overflow, amen. Every person who walks through our doors is family. Welcome home. Did you get something out of this? Does this help anybody this morning? Come on, let's just give the Lord a big thank you.